So we heard a, uh, a, a, about a talk on security. So this session is uh, security, storage, and architecture. So next talk will be by Professor Ethan Miller uh, from UCSC on storage. So. Uh, Ethan, actually, we never overlapped, so I actually, I, this is the first time I met Ethan. Um, so he's a professor uh, of computer science uh, at UCSC, and he's also a director of um, this NSF Center of, uh, for Research in Storage Systems, and associate director of the Storage Systems Research Center at UC Santa Cruz. Um, so Ethan's research uh, broadly focuses on storage and file systems, and distributed systems as well as operating systems. And he's uh, Randy's uh, tenth PhD graduate. <laughs> is that the view from my window? No, that is Santa Cruz. It is not the view from my window. I'd be nice if it were the view from my window, but no, it's not. <laughs> um, that's actually from Natural Bridges State State Beach, which um, unfortunately uh, they, they, they used to have multiple bridges. Now it's just got one bridge left. So I guess it's Natural Bridge State Beach. <laughs> so. Uh, I actually looked, and it turns out, as, as, as I said, I'm, I'm Randy student number 10. Um, you know, there's my entry here. Uh, but I discovered a couple of things when I looked at, uh, at Randy's, uh, Randy's uh, students page. First one is that uh, it hasn't been updated for a while. He's got a lot of assistant professors on there. I'm going, wait, they're, they're tenured. Wait a sec. <laughs> but but the, uh, wait, 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 Randy, but there's more. See, over here, uh, L. <laughs> I, I have no idea how long it's been that way. <laughs> Okay, so the, the goal here for, for this, for, for the, the, my goal in, in research for the last about 20 years has been to explore the bleeding edge of storage systems. And when I said space and time, what I was primarily talking about is size. Okay, so building storage systems that hold petabytes to even exabytes, and time is both making them really fast, but also making it so they last a really long time. And it turns out that's, that both of those are pretty challenging. And I'll talk briefly about some of the stuff we did a little longer ago, and I'll spend most of the time talking about Pure Storage, which is a startup that uh, I've been working with for about the last six years to try and use Flash to do enterprise storage. So the first thing I want to talk about is Ceph, which is just big and fast storage. And it turns out that Ceph has well, it also spawned a startup. Uh, the goal here that we had was to scale storage from peta, you know, to get up to petabytes or even exabytes of storage, and to do it in a way that basically made sure there wasn't any bottleneck. And the big problem here when you build very big storage systems is you've got literally hundreds of thousands of clients, maybe a million disks and a bunch of metadata servers, and these all have to work together in a way that actually, A, doesn't have bottlenecks, and B, realize that everything, that something is going to be failed all the time. When we started on this, the idea was, gee, build the disk, build these things out of, for example, you know, RAID, RAID 5 here. They said, oh, RAID 5, that's great, we'll never fail. We pointed out to them that when you did the math, you actually had one of their RAID 5 servers failing every couple of days. They weren't very happy when we pointed that out, so we actually found ways around that. The big things we did was, first of all, push the functionality to the individual components. So as much as possible, data layout is localized in the object storage devices. You tell a device, store this object, and it says, okay, I'll figure out how. Don't put any kind of layout stuff over here. The only thing these guys know how to do is where does this object live? That's it. That also meant that we don't have centralization. If these guys can figure out where the objects live, so can the object storage devices. All the clients have to do when they, when they open a file is talk to a metadata server. They can then access this multi-gigabyte file block by block without having to talk to anybody else. No bottlenecks. Omdahl's law really, really hurts when you have a million devices. And handling failure, same thing. We don't want the clients to handle the failure. We don't want the metadata service to do it. We want the object storage devices to do it. Got to make them a little smarter. Uh, I actually, in the interest of time, left out the slide that talks all about the, uh, the cool protocol we have for doing this. But we actually figured out a way using, using basically primary copy replication, having the devices here handle it themselves. And trying as much as possible to keep everything away from these clients so that in an HPC environment, they can go as fast as possible. So just to give you an idea as to where Ceph is, Ceph was done by uh, Sage Weil in his PhD thesis uh, back in 2006. Sage, has, Sage worked on it for about six, seven years, formed a company called Ink Tank, which was bought two years ago for $175 million by Red Hat. So Ceph has done pretty well, and you know, we're very happy about that. The next thing I want to talk briefly about is Pergamum. Now, Pergamum is an archival storage system. The idea is that we want to build very large-scale storage, but here's where the time thing comes in. 
The way that most people build storage systems is they say, well, we'll build the storage system, you'll go buy it, and then five years from now, you'll buy a new one, you'll put it next to it, and you'll start a copy. And hopefully the copy will finish. And I say that because when you build a system that's an archive, it's not exactly a given that the copy will finish in any reasonable time. Uh, if you ask, for example, the people, when I looked at this stuff back when I was doing my thesis, by the way, the numbers haven't changed as far as actual time to do it, it would take them literally six months to migrate from one tape silo to another tape silo. And of course, that's six months where you've got to devote a dozen tape drives to doing this. They were buying equipment just to move from one thing to another, which is really bad. So we said, let's build a system that's evolvable so that I can go ahead here and say, you know, this thing over here is old. Take it, throw it away, put a new one in. New technology, of course. And do that over and over again. So again, to do this, we relied on the same kind of thing we had in Ceph. We devised something called a tome, and we picked the name tome. Uh, I, I, one thing I learned from Berkeley is you got to pick good names that are interesting. Uh, Pergamum is actually, it turned out that, you, that, that Berkeley beat us to the punch. We were going to use Alexandria, but, well, Berkeley's library thing already had used Alexandria. So we picked Pergamum, which was, in fact, the second largest library in the ancient world. Oh, well. Uh, but it did turn out, by the way, that Pergamum was the library that managed the transition from paper, from papyrus, which decays really easily, to parchment, which doesn't. And so, yeah, we figured that was pretty appropriate. So we, do, we, we have these things called tomes that are smart enough to function independently. So here's a diagram of what a tome looks like. We actually prototype this by going down to um, Fry's, picking up some of those early network storage devices, you know, the ones with Ethernet on them. They have flash, they have memory. We just had, they all ran Linux, we just hacked them. And we built a system that actually used these to provide both interdisk redundancy, which I'll get to in a minute, and also redundancy on the disk itself, which is something most people didn't do a lot of. We also, again, to try and handle Amdahl's law, said when we're handling errors, handle them locally. Don't try to handle them elsewhere, because if you do, it won't scale. And of course, this is an archive, and we all know how much people want to pay for archiving. The answer is zero. So we have to control costs. So to do this, what we did, one of the things we pioneered was the idea that we would have redundancy on a drive itself. So here's your data and your parity. And then entire drives devoted to parity. So in other words, this is RAID across devices, but also RAID within a device. And we did this because storage devices, disks, flash, everything else, tend to rot. They tend to have their sectors go bad. Well, you don't want to have your sector go bad and then have to wake up somebody else to try and fix it. You want to fix it locally. So that's what we did. Another thing that we, tried, that we did was try to figure out a better way to, do verif to verify data consistency. And to do this, we used uh, algebraic signatures, homomorphic signatures. Basically, here's your data. XOR them together, you get parity. That's RAID. Well, we actually found a way of, doing, of using hash functions where you XOR the hash functions together and you get the signature of the parity. Why is this important? Well, down here we have our devices. Let's go ahead and compute the signatures. Let's compute the signatures of the signatures. Let's compute signatures of those and these all satisfy the parity relationship. So what does this mean? This means that if I spin up tome one and compute all the parity, I can spin up tome, tome two a day later. And I can now spin up tome three and tome four, as long as I store these signatures in NVRAM or something like that, which I will. I can now compute whether these things are internally consistent without actually spinning up all the disks. Saves energy. So again, number one, get to reuse RAID. And number two, we actually get to build something that's, again, energy efficient. So we can do this pretty, eff pretty effectively. So we then moved on and said, you know, OK, we've got archival storage. That's great. And now what's going to happen is that Edward Snowden is going to come in and steal all of our data. Uh, and this is a project which uh, we did in, back in 2007, and it turns out has gotten a lot of interest re recently from particularly government organizations. Gee, I wonder why. Because what we did here was instead of saying we're going to encrypt everything and put it in one place so that somebody can steal it, we devised techniques to actually spread it out over multiple independent archives. So we give one nth of it to each archive, and in order to break it, you have to steal stuff from all of them. The idea being, sure, Edward Snowden breaks into that archive, doesn't break into that one and that one and that one. Okay. But what I want to spend most of the time talking about here is a relatively recent thing about started about six years ago, which was building a disk storage uh, building a storage array from flash rather than disk. Okay. Now, obviously today everyone goes flash is great. We all love flash, but it turns out that building an array from flash is not as easy as you might think it is. Um, first thing is that we, that we realize is that disk algorithms cost too much when you run them on flash because overwrite in place, which just about every disk array does, not anymore, but they used to, is, flat, is really bad for flash. 
The second thing, and this is something that most people don't realize, is that flash drives are slow if you mix reads and writes. At least most of them are. Maximum read time for a disk might be 10, 15 milliseconds. We've seen flash give you read times of, and I'm not kidding, over a second. Now, doesn't do that all the time, but if you're writing to it and reading at the same time, you end up with these bottlenecks where that can happen. Failures are also different. Um, how many of you have ever had a flash drive fail? Really? Did it actually fail, or, or, did, or, did, or is it one of these you rebooted it, it was okay? Bitrot failed. Fail. Well, no, bitrot is not the whole drive failing. That's a sector failing. That's actually the whole point. I believe completely that you lost the sector. That's, that's not that uncommon. But the whole thing didn't fail. Yep. Discs, the whole thing, you, you have had the whole thing fail? Twice. Twice. Okay, Kirk, I stand corrected. We do, we do lose a few of them, but not very many. <laughs> a lot fewer than disc, where if I asked how many of you had a disc fail, I'm going to guess it wouldn't be one person. It would be two-thirds of the room. So the second thing we have to worry about here is that the flat, if you built it all out of flash, it would cost too much, because flash is still more expensive than disc. And the last thing is that the storage stack is not built for flash, because for flash, we don't care about seek, at least not for read. Compression and dedupe turns out, A, they don't work very well for disk, because, and B, gee, why are you bothering to compress and dedupe? Now you have even fewer, even fewer IOs per gigabyte, which is not exactly helpful. And flash, read is almost free. So we built a system that actually used all those things. So basically what we did is we, we have a couple of principles that we decided to follow. First one is we never change information, we only outdate it. Okay, so you never overwrite anything in place, literally. All of our data structures are append only. And all of our metadata is labeled with sequence numbers, so we can tell which one comes first. The data isn't because the data just is there as long as there's something pointing to it, and if there's nothing pointing to it, then you get rid of it. Second thing we did is we said, look, instead of trying to keep accurate counts of where something was or how many pointers to it there were and so on, don't bother. Figure it out when you need it because writes are expensive. And if you do this, you write less stuff. You do read more stuff, but if you have 20 drives, each one of them capable of 20,000 IOs per second, that's 400,000 IOPS right there. And that's only 20,000 reads per second. Most drives now are between 50 and 100,000. This means do the reads, don't worry about the writes. Third thing, save space. Compress and dedupe heavily if you can. All right? Fourth thing we did, and this is, this is something which, I, which is one of these, we never think of this in research, but when you're trying to build a real thing, it matters. Reuse your code. Build as little code as you can. When you, when you build a system like this, you have a lot of code. For example, we use RAID. And we use it for both reliability and performance. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We have one KV store, and we have a dozen different uh, KV tables. We actually don't have, uh, for pure storage, the way that you power down the system, there's no shutdown command. The actual recommended way to shut a system down is to go to the back of it and pull the plug out. That's recommended. That's not, that's not we can handle it. It's, we don't have any other way to do it because it's like, well, if we got to be able to handle this anyway, why not just make that the only way? Why make two? And the last thing, and I'll talk briefly about it also, is scale up rather than scale out, which given what we did with Ceph and Pergamum seems like an awfully odd choice, right? But in fact, it turns out to be good for Flash. So if we think about the entire world as an append-only log, what does that mean? Well, we have a bunch of key value stores. And again, there are multiple different types of keys. There's a dedupe store. There's a user table. There's a table that does a bunch of other address translation. But the values are all small. And that's something that we discovered was very different from existing key value stores. They all had people think of it as, well, you've got a key, and then you've got a block. You don't want that. You want your key to be a pointer. Key, key is you know, an address, and a value is a pointer to something. That way, when you do garbage collection, at least on the metadata, it's fast. You don't have to copy data around just because you have some other stuff outdated. Turns out to win. Now, the key value store structure is layered. looks kind of like a log-structured merge tree, and data is written in segments that look like this. And again, once you write something, you never overwrite it. You can obviously move it elsewhere. You can occlude it by newer information. And you can make it irrelevant. So for example, if you have a snapshot you don't need anymore, throw it away. We never reuse internal identifiers. And that turns out to be a big win. It's not like we have uh, a pointer and then we get rid of it, we get something back. We never reuse it. So one of the things we had to do was build an append-only invalidation structure that didn't grow infinitely large. And the way to do that is pretty simple. Keep appending, but instead of storing actual invalid numbers, store ranges. And then you can go through and merge together adjacent ranges. If you do this, you end up with a structure that has 
in the best case at most one hole for every piece of data you have this range is invalid this one's invalid the identifier in the middle is valid the number of holes is proportional to the amount of data you have the amount of storage you have so doesn't matter how long it goes the number of holes once the table's been optimized doesn't grow infinitely so we thought that was pretty good now again this is also heavily compressed and deduped but we do have highly sequential writes we write everything out as a log segment so mendel log structured file systems good thing now the thing is that the reads can be very very random i mean we're doing dedupe and compression so we got a lot of very random reads but this is a very good trade-off for flash because sequential writes are fast random reads are also fast so we don't care that the uh, the access pattern looks like somebody uh, like a jackson pollock painting we don't care as long as it's fast works pretty well so why not since this is you know since i was part of the raid group i'll tell you another way to use raid raid of course is good for reliability and we use it for performance why well here's a raid group okay you got data you got parity it's raid six uh, but that's okay it works pretty well let's say that now i want to write this but this this segment here okay this part of a segment and i want to write it to this ssd all right so when that ssd is being written what happens well I'm writing this thing. Now, of course, writes can do all sorts of interesting things. It can trigger garbage collection. It can tie up internal resources. And now, when you issue a read to it, that read goes slowly. Well, again, this is Flash. So you know, with a disk, I wouldn't want to use the IOs to read from all these other ones. But this is Flash, so eh, just kill that and read from five other ones. Once I read from those, I can rebuild. And again, the latency isn't any higher. Yes, I use more IOs to do this. But remember, we had lots of IOs per second to deal with, so this is a pretty good trade-off. So turns out that, that uh, not only does this uh, reduce the read latency, both the mean and the variance, it also means that our rebuild path gets executed all the time. So when something does fail, like somebody goes, hey, let's demo this and pull out one of the SSDs, that's apparently one of the favorite things to do, it actually works. I don't laugh. This is, you know, this is one of those things where uh, I don't know if we're going to see the, uh, the raid video later on, but that was one of the demos we did. And, you know, you got to be careful about that. So again, you move on to the next one. Same deal. So let's talk briefly about scale up and scale out. A lot of the projects that the, the, a lot of the earlier projects we did were disk based and used scale out. So you'd have your, your controller, a lot of disks, add more disks, add more controllers, no problem. And that's actually how you have to build for disks because if you have a disk, you can't control thousands of disks from one controller. And if you want performance like 200K IOPS, you need a thousand disks. That'd be really hard to do from a single pair of controllers, it just wouldn't scale. But now we have Flash. And now Flash, we can get the same IOs per second from fewer, uh, fewer Flash drives. So we could, certainly could scale out by, scale, scale by doing this. But it turns out that for scaling, if you try to distribute things, you have to do a bunch of overhead. All right, there have been a couple of papers recently, we didn't write them, but there are a couple of papers where they, where they show performance at scales like this, right? And then someone pointed out, you know, at this end, where you have 32 nodes scaling to that point, a single node doing the same thing is twice as fast. Now, that's really great if what you're gonna do is tell me I wanna build a thousand of them, but remember, we can do actually 400K IOPS pretty easily using a single pair of controllers. So don't do this, do scale up. If you want more capacity, add more SSDs or add bigger SSDs. But the fact is, the vast majority of users, and again, I'm excluding Google, Facebook, and a few others, don't need a lot more than 400K IOPS, at least not with current software stacks. Now, if this changes in the future, we are going to have to look at building things that actually scale better. But this is easy to build, and it's easy to say we got one of them that works well. OK. So let's talk about a couple of common principles I've got that, we, that, 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 we, that uh, I learned over the last 20 years doing research in this. The first one is scale out does work well, except of course for the overhead. So scale out works well, except where it doesn't. We, we've done a lot of work in leveraging quirks and storage. Storage keeps evolving. And so we've got to be able to leverage, you know, uh, di what, what disk does well, what flash does well. We actually have a project that we're working on now to leverage what non-volatile memory, byte addressable does well. Reliability and security matter a lot. I didn't talk about these because it takes too long to go through how, how, how to build something reliable and secure. But the last thing is that Amdahl's law does continue to rule what people do for storage systems. Much as we try to get away with it, it doesn't help. So 
couple of observations that I wanted to make from the last 20 years, and, and this is stuff which, you know, learn it at Berkeley, do stuff elsewhere. First one is that good colleagues and grad students do make a huge difference. And I've been very fortunate to, try, to have very good colleagues and very good grad students just about every, everywhere I've gone, starting with Berkeley, by the way. So I wanted to thank Randy for that. Um, the second thing that, that I learned at Berkeley is that if you, if you predict things that are going to happen before they happen, five years in advance, you have a chance to make a big impact. If you wait till it's a problem, you don't. And I can tell you that in about three or four different research projects, we've had people, when we started the project, go, why are you doing that? That's not bad. It doesn't hurt us right now. Three or four or five years later, they decide, wait a sec. Now that's hurting us. Thank you for doing the research so it's not so bad. And again, this is something that, that, that has been a big deal. Pergamum has been leading to power efficient design. Ceph got sold to Red Hat. Pure storage started back when Flash actually was expensive and not very big. Another thing that I learned at Berkeley that, I, that, that, we've, that I've done a lot of is made sure that we interact with industry because industry is a source for both problems and funds. And for the group that we have, which is in uh, Santa Cruz, uh, closer to Silicon Valley than we are now, um, it turns out proximity is really good. Driving distance to Silicon Valley means that we can interact frequently with industry. It means we can bring students and talk to people in industry. And I'll tell you, students love that because they get jobs when they graduate. Right? And a lot of students aren't going to end up going to be professors, despite the fact that a lot of Randys have. And of course, industry is a good sink for students and for ideas. So you know, if you're going to have a source for stuff, you want to have a sink as well. The last thing I learned, and this is why I thought it was really great going to work at Pure Storage for a year and being associated with them for five years, is that Getting ideas to market and doing them in industry is very different from academic stuff. And it's a lesson that, I'm, that I think more professors, and I'm not talking about anyone in this room specifically, but it's a lesson that more professors really ought to learn going to work in industry for a year or actually interacting closely with them. Because if you don't do this, you end up with ideas that are great research papers and completely irrelevant. Having contact with industry gets you an idea of what kinds of things are likely to be relevant. And I'm not saying solve a problem that's good next year, but in five years, is this going to matter? If you don't know what matters now, how are you going to know the answer to that one? So with that, uh, I think I'm finishing on time, and I'm happy to take questions. Questions. Uh, thanks for the great talk. A mm -hmm. technical detail question. Uh, yes, please. What you mentioned with regard to the unpredictable latency mm -hmm. of SSDs when you mix read and write. Yes. Where can we find um, published data on that? Uh, let's see. We haven't, so the problem, I've also discovered one other thing about working at a startup, and I know why startups don't publish papers. It's not because they don't want to publish papers, it's because they're busily working on the next release. Uh, I don't think we ever wrote anything up on that. There may be some stuff written up on that. Uh, I, can try, I can try and find something that other people have written. Is there a blog? Or there might be a blog entry we have. I can look. Um, and, and could you uh, please briefly talk about how that was actually done? How we found it? Uh, the answer is that in, in doing the work on deciding which SSDs we wanted to use and how we're going to use them, we actually have a test harness where we basically mimic our I.O. pattern, lots and lots of reads and writes at, at various things, and, discover, and measure latency. OK, so if we know we're writing segments which are, in this case, let's say one megabyte, sorry, write, write units, uh, one megabyte long, and then we try to do reads at the same time, we observed the reads ran slow. In fact, we observed kind of a train effect. What would happen is that you'd write, well, you'd write something big, this read would be slow, and so would the five reads you issued after it, because they're all waiting for this read to finish. Okay. We actually experimentally observed this, and the reason is that there's internal garbage collection. Some drive families are worse than others. Uh, without naming names, and by the way, it's, it's not only just drive, it's not manufacturers, it's specific drive models. So this drive model does it, this one does it not as bad, this one does it even, does it differently. And things like what's the optimal I.O. size, striping, you know, stride and everything else, we actually have programs that, that we run on all the SSDs we use to try and optimize that. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any pointers to papers we've written, but uh, but I, I can. I'm happy to talk to you about it if you want. If you want more information on that. That's good. Um, any other questions? Yeah. 
the Randy style, and I think the Berkeley style in general, is that the grad students do the coding and run the experiments and the professors advise. Yep. What has this been like for you at Santa Cruz and what was this shift like? That's, a, that's an excellent question. So the peer storage stuff obviously is not grad students, although I will say that of the six, uh, of, the, of the founding engineers at Pure Storage, two of them were former grad students from our group who actually worked on Ceph. Uh, so Pure Storage, much of the coding is done by Pure Storage engineers, because let's face it, it's a company. Uh, for Ceph and Pergamum, a lot of the coding was done by grad students, because uh, if you get good grad students, and we do get them at, at uh, Santa Cruz, not as many as we get at Berkeley, but we get them at Santa Cruz, they can do really good research. Uh, for some other things, it gets a little frustrating when grad students are writing code slowly or uh, it's, code's pretty bad. But if you get good grad students, and I, as I said, I've been fortunate to have quite a few, they are actually generating code just as good as people at Berkeley have. Okay, um, so let's thank our speaker again. Okay.